theme for the message this morning titled Commissioned to Go and Make Disciples. Commissioned to Go and Make Disciples. Focusing on the Bible reading that we have just heard. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 in particular. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. This morning I wish to focus on five points taken from this specific passage of Scripture. The first is in regards to the question of authority. We know that we have been commissioned to go and to make disciples, but just before looking at that point, it is important to understand where our authority comes from. Jesus himself says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Jesus has authority not just on earth, but he has authority also in heaven. That is, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. When Jesus commissions us then to go and to make disciples, it is grounded in his authority as Lord of heaven and earth. Why is this point important to understand? As you know, we are often, we are often timid in our witness, often lacking courage and boldness to perhaps even share about our faith. But by remembering that our authority is not based on who we are as such, but based on the authority of Jesus himself, then this should empower us to obey Jesus' command and to do so proudly. If I told you to go overseas to England and to start up a new church there, you would probably dismiss my instruction, as I'm just a local minister here in Malulabar with no authority in England. If, however, the Queen of England wrote to you asking you to start up a new church in London, then you would probably want to go, because you know that the Queen has much more authority than I do. And if someone asked you why you were going to England, then you would probably say quite proudly, oh, I'm going because of the Queen of England herself has asked me to do so. I'm going on her behalf. I am her ambassador. ambassador. Have you ever considered your calling as a Christian to be like an ambassador? An ambassador is an accredited diplomat or an official representative sent by the state as its representative in another country. Do you know that as a Christian, you are an accredited, recognised, official representative of Christ Jesus, who is not just Lord of earth, but he's Lord of heaven and earth? Do you not know that you have been commissioned by none other than the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Some of you may be familiar with the Christian ministry called Ambassadors for Christ, which started up a little while ago now. This ministry started up because of their conviction that they are indeed (coughs) Ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors for Christ International states on their website that they exist to equip churches all across Australia to be effective in evangelism. We believe that as we train up local churches to reach out to people in their communities, we will see revival take place in our country and more people than than ever will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Saviour. Paul in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. Fear is dispelled when we understand that our authority comes from Jesus, who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We speak, therefore, not of our own authority, but on the authority that has been given to us. 
Noting that our authority and our power is not, of, is not one of rule and dominance over others, but our authority is based on service, and we are to do this in all humility. Noting, noting of course, Matthew 20, 28, which reminds us that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. So the first key point here is that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus, and it is in the light of that authority that we have been commissioned to be his disciples or his ambassadors. They should give us confidence to speak and act on his behalf because we are indeed accredited, recognised, official representatives of none other than the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And again, this authority is not about dominance, it's not about force, it's not about coercion and power. It is about service, serving others in humility and in love. Secondly, we have been commissioned by the authority given to Jesus Christ to go and to make disciples of all nations. Key word, go. Go means to move. It is an action word. It is a doing word. Therefore, says Jesus, in the light of my authority, go. Opposite to the word go is, of course, to stay put. Do not do anything. But we are not called to stay put. We are called to go. To make disciples of all nations means that our mission is not simply personal and private. That is, our ministry is not simply to the privacy of our souls, but a ministry to the nations, to the world, a ministry to every human being on the face of this earth. It is a ministry to the world because the problem of sin has affected or infected every human being, including creation as a whole. To make disciples, then, is not a process of getting people to follow a particular religion, namely Christianity. That is, discipleship is not about getting people to follow some teachings of a religious sage or some religious spiritual leader. No, discipleship is much more radical than that. Discipleship is about the new radical thing that has happened in the light of the death and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Again, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, in terms of the new reality that has now occurred, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. Discipleship then is, is about getting people to realise this new reality, this new thing that has happened. Death has been defeated. The power that sin and death once had over us has now been uh, broken, uh, destroyed, in and through what Christ has done for us. As we know, fear can be very debilitating. Clinical psychologist Dr. Jordan Peterson says the following. I have dealt with people who have anxiety disorders. And one thing with people who have anxiety disorders is that they are not mysterious to me. It is no problem for me to understand why people have anxiety disorders or why they, they are depressed or why they have substance use problems. The mystery to me is always why people don't have all of these things at once because everyone has a reason to be anxious. In fact, we have the ultimate reason to be anxious because we know that we are vulnerable and we know that we are going to die. And how you cannot be anxious under those circumstances, says Peterson, is a great mystery. It is a massive mystery, he says. And the same thing applies to depression. And the same thing applies to some degree to drug and alcohol abuse because there's plenty of reasons to drown your consciousness in alcohol, that's for sure. 
and the sort of drugs that people are prone to take are chemicals that take the affective edge of the tragedy of life. End of quote. How then do you overcome this innate anxiety that we have because of the knowledge that we are vulnerable and that we are going to die? Dr. Jordan Peterson, referring to the story of Abraham in the Old Testament, says that Abraham is self-conscious and is naturally afraid of having to leave his own family and his homeland and the dangers associated with moving into the great unknown. But Abraham, nevertheless, still makes the decision to move forward into the great unknown. And that's the appropriate response, says Peterson, in the face of actual non-naive understanding of what constitutes life. That is one of the secrets of life, says Peterson. One of the secrets to a good life is to recognise your limitations and how you might be hurt, but you nevertheless move forward anyway, despite these fears. I often use Peterson's work and his studies because he articulates very well for us the real struggles that we as human beings have in terms of our anxiety, depression and substance abuses and so forth because of this innate fear of death that is within us as human beings. Where the Bible differs with Jordan Peterson's method, however, even though Jordan Peterson lectures on the Bible, is that the Bible always emphasises the power of God as a source of power or strength that helps us to overcome our fears. That is, for example, it was not Abraham's human capacity as such that enabled him to leave his homeland and to begin a journey to the promised land. No, was not based on his decision or, or his human capacity. It was the fact that God called Abraham. It was the fact that God spoke directly to Abraham saying, go, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Noting that Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. At the age of 75, leaving his homeland would have been the last thing on his mind. Why then did he all of a sudden have a change of heart? Because God called him. God commissioned him to go. And as Christians then, the way we overcome our fears is not through psychological techniques as such, in terms of mind over matter. No, it is about faith in Christ as the one who has overcome the powers of darkness on our behalf. We are only able to overcome sin and death, in other words, not because we are able to overcome sin and death ourselves, but because Christ has overcome it on our behalf so that it is through the power of God that we are saved, not through the power of our minds or the power of human intellect. That is our method of salvation from sin and the effects of sin such as anxiety, depression and substance abuse and so forth is not psychological as such, but Christological. Christological means that salvation is a work of God, minted out or hammered out literally in and through the life, works, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hence why the authority is always on Christ, as it is Christ who has done the work of salvation on our behalf. Making disciples then is about calling people into this new life that Christ Jesus has carved out for us in and through his life, his death and his resurrection. And this is not just good news but radical news, awesome news that must be shared with the world as a whole. 
Thirdly, this commission to go and to make disciples includes baptising people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The key point here is that the inward change that happens to us in terms of being incorporated into the new life of Christ Jesus is to be expressed, says Jesus, through this external act of baptism, of being washed physically with water. Some often argue about whether physical baptism is required for salvation. However, I think this is a pointless question. Now, the question of salvation is God's question alone. Only God knows who is saved and who is not saved. What we are called to do is to baptise. Of course, not all Christians will be baptised before they die. However, this does not mean that we do not need to baptise. Noting that even Jesus himself was baptised, even though he had no sin. He was perfect in every regards. Baptism then signifies in a real or in an ontological way that we are actually participating in the life of Christ. We share in his death, symbolised by going under the water, as well as we share in his new life, in his new resurrected Christ, emphasised or highlighted in the act of coming out of the water. Baptism is the key ritual to publicly testify to the new change that has occurred in our lives. It is the formal way of becoming a member of the body of Christ in the church. Noting that baptism is always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Today, as some of you may know, is Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday, we affirm this mystery that God is three in one, one in three. Some Christians do not believe in the doctrine of, Trini of the Trinity because the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. It is, of course, true that the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Bible. The Christian church has never claimed that the word Trinity appears in Scripture. Why then do we believe in the doctrine of of the Trinity. The moment you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are immediately entering into the mystery of God's being as three in one. The moment you acknowledge the deity of the Holy Spirit, you immediately enter into the mystery of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is our confession that there are not three gods mentioned in the Bible, but that there is only one God who reveals himself to us as three distinct persons. If you remove the doctrine of the Trinity, or if you remove the principle that holds together the three as one, then you will fall into the danger of tritheism the heresy of believing in three separate gods. As we know, however, in the Old Testament, God reminds Israel over and over again that the Lord your God is one, and that they must worship the one true God of Israel. To worship other gods is to commit idolatry. It is, of course, why Jesus was crucified by the Jews in the New Testament Precisely because of his claim to be God. If we are to maintain the Old Testament truth that there is one God and not to suggest that Jesus Christ is a new or a different God, then the doctrine of the Trinity is necessary for maintaining the constant belief attested to in Scripture that there is only one God. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Not in the name of three separate gods, but in the name of one God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Fourthly, Jesus commissions the disciples to teach. Teach everyone to obey everything I have commanded. 
The key word here is the word obey, a word that is not very popular in our modern context. Teach people to obey the word of God, says Jesus. Obedience is key to entering into the new life that Christ offers. If there is no obedience, then one cannot be a disciple of Jesus. One cannot truly enter into the new life that Christ offers. One cannot love God if there is no obedience to his commandments. Jesus says in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Here love is directly linked to the act of obedience. We often think that love is simply an emotion or a feeling towards someone. But here Jesus links love to the act of obeying his commandments. We are commissioned to teach people to obey his commandments. The difficult question, how do you teach people to obey Jesus Christ's commandments? Here we can learn a lot from the Old Testament. In particular, we learn a lot from the Jews. Jewish education has been valued since the birth of Judaism. Abraham is lauded for instructing his offspring in God's ways. One of the basic duties of Jewish parents is to provide for the instruction of their children, as set forth in the first paragraph of the Shema, ye Israel prayer, which is found in Deuteronomy 6, 6-9, which says, Take to heart these instructions with which I charge you this day, Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign of your, on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. Jewish children were also advised to seek the instruction of the parents as in Deuteronomy 32, 7, which says, Remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father and he will tell you. Ask your elders and they will explain to you. The book of Proverbs also contains many verses related to education. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. The key here is to teach and to train our children when they are young. Teaching is always a continuous and an ongoing duty. Because of our problem of forgetfulness, because of our problem of selective hearing, teaching must be continuous and ongoing from one generation to the next. Teaching obedience is critical because it is obedience to Christ that enables us to actually live in him and he in us. Fifthly and finally, as we are going and making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you, finally Jesus gives us assurance that he will always be with us to the very end of the age. We have here not simply a cosy reassurance, as one author puts it, but what we have here is a necessary equipment for mission. That is, this was not a feel-good statement, but a necessary part of God's equipping his disciples with the knowledge that he will be truly present with them all the way even to till the end of the age. This is the meaning of the word Emmanuel, the name by which Jesus is to be called. Emmanuel means God with us. That is, Jesus is Emmanuel precisely because in Christ, God is with us. So our prayer this morning is this. May this knowledge, Emmanuel, that God is always with us. May this continue to give us strength and courage as we seek to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.